Dear guests, colleagues, students, friends, it's very good to see you again for uh, the sixth lecture uh, of the East Aegean and Anatolia lecture series uh, of ARVAS 2022 um, for the year 2022. And it's my greatest pleasure to announce um, Murat Akar today. Uh, a very uh, successful young researcher from Turkey uh, who uh, was also a former graduate of the Settlement Archaeology program where I also teach uh, at Middle East Technical University. Um, so Murat, after uh, completing his uh, bachelor's degree from the Archaeology and History of Art Dep Department of Bilkent University, um, he received his master's degree from the Settlement Archaeology of Middle East Technical University. And upon this, he went on to complete his PhD degree in the Near Eastern Archaeology Department of the University of Florence in Italy. And being a former research fellow at Koch University's Center for Anatolian Civilizations, also known as ANAMED, and the Archaeology and History of Art Department of the same university, Murat Akar has been teaching at Hatay, Hatay Mustafa Kemal University's Department of Archaeology since 2016. His research areas include architecture, memory and landscape studies, particularly for the second millennium BC of Anatolia, the Near East and the Levant. However, we all know Murat as the director of the recent director of the Amuk Valley Regional Survey Project, um, and the excavations um, here on at Tel Achana, Al, um, the ancient city of Alalak, and the scientific advisor and field director to the rescue excavations at Toprakisar Hüyük, run by Hatay Archaeological Museum. His current research addresses in these areas to uh, the role of the climate uh, changes in uh, long-term uh, perspectives for understanding the continuously shifting population dynamics and cross-cultural encounters in Eastern Mediterranean contexts as part of the TÜBİTAK, Tur uh, the Turkish Scientific Council's uh, projects, the geological and archaeological traces of climatic changes in the Amuk Valley of Hatay during the Holocene. Today, Murat's presentation title is From Petty Kingdoms to Empires, the Changing Social and Political Dynamics from Middle to Late Bronze Ages in Southeastern Anatolia, a point of view from the Amuk Valley of Hatay. So Murat Ojam, thank you for being with us today and uh, the floor is yours. Okay, uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, I guess you can hear me, right? Just I'm double checking. Yes, no problem. Okay, great. Okay. Uh, all right. So, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, dear colleagues, friends, and fellows from all over the world. It's a pleasure to be here online, and I would like to begin by giving my most sincere thanks to Professor Dr. Chida Matakuman for her kind invitation. It's an honor. For Arva Anatolia lecture series, I have been asked to contribute on Southeastern Anatolia's second millennium BC, and I gladly accepted. But just after a week later, I was also invited by Arva Levant session by Artemis Georgiou and Ionir Milevsky, and I gladly accepted that too. These two invitations mark the importance of Amuk Valley of Hatay as the region touches upon highly entangled research questions from Anatolia to the Levant and Mesopotamia. The Arva Levant lecture will be in December, but don't worry, it's not going to be the same talk. And we will present the results of our sediment coring project, which I will briefly introduce at the end of this talk. I also would like to begin by giving my most special thanks to Professor Dr. Aslan Yenar, for encouragement to expand the archaeological practice in the Amuk Valley into a multi-proxy research program focusing on several topics from political to economic, social and environmental reconstructions, and for establishing a research center 
which maintains an open access policy to collections full year. This ARVA lecture is an outcome of the various intertwined research projects of 20 years centered around the second millennium BC capital city of the kingdom of Mukish, Telachana, Alwa. So perhaps I should begin by asking why Don Valley has a crucial value for Anatolian, Near Eastern, <coughs> and Levantine archaeology. We can list a number of reasons from being at a transactory buffer zone, revealing a mix of material culture to an ecological niche with rich fauna and flora, as well as to the presence of archival sources throughout the almost whole second millennium BC, revealing information on the stages of transformations from petty kingdoms to empires. Telachana is one of the few sites that revealed a continuous second millennium sequence, thus it's an anchorage point. When combined with the research at Teltaina, this data set expands from early Bronze Age to Iron Age, so both ends of the second millennium history of the region can be reconstructed. The end of third millennium BC and the beginnings of second millennium BC is an intriguing topic due to the collapse of early city-states, empires, and trade systems followed by the formation of new political identities forged from Umbrites and Hurrians on the one side in northern Mesopotamia and Hittites in central Anatolia. Several controversial trajectories from conflicts to movements of ethnically distinct groups or impacts of environmental triggers such as climate change, the dynamics behind change or continuity from early Bronze Age to the Middle Bronze Age dominates the literature in Near Eastern archaeology. From the standpoint of Anatolian archaeology, on the other hand, the late third millennium BC trade dynamics, followed by all the Syrian trade system, became a unique study case for understanding the structural relationship between economics and social encounters through various modes of mobility. Yet due to the fascinating and perhaps overwhelming amount of textual data, coming from major centers such as Kültepe, but with limited textual and archeological data from elsewhere, the Anatolian research field is dominated by peer-to-peer -peer economic interaction patterns between Asur, central Anatolian kingdoms and their affiliated merchant quarters. As a result, this monolithic text-based image of the Middle Bronze Age Old Assyrian trade work decontextualized the roles and various intents of regional contributors. This certainly owes much of its reasoning to the absence or limited nature of the textual and material evidence from majority of the regional centers or to the total absence of data from peripheries. It is also not surprising to see that the stakeholders of Near Eastern, Levantine and Anatolian archeology span have different research goals and motivations creating disconnected stories in an extremely connected landscape. In this talk, I will try to tie various regions through a reading of the current evidence in hand from, two, from three locations in the Amok Valley marked in this map. In that respect, and nevertheless, the archeology span of the Amok Valley has a crucial value in understanding this particular period of transformations, where traces of cultural, economic, and political interactions between distant and distinct cultures of Anatolia the Near East, as well as Levantine, Egyptian, and Aegean counterparts can be traced from stages of chiefdoms to city-states and then to kingdoms and empires. With much respect to Robert Braidwood's pioneering surveying and excavation program, Amuk Valley has its own regional chronology and still stands as an anchorage point for researchers interested in the larger understanding and synchronization of culture encounters over longer durations. Thus, the region has the potential to provide answers to a long list of research questions that dominate the literature from systems of exchange to controversial topics such as climate change induced collapse, urbanization, and long distance human mobility patterns. This statement certainly relies on massive amounts of data sets created by 1930s excavations. Telechana was targeted by Sir Leonard Woolley providing second millennium BC archeological and textual anchorages to kingdom of Mukish and its capital city, Alala. At Tal Tainat, 
the Zero Hittite expedition explored the lesser known third millennium dynamics and revealed the first millennium BC sequence with, ref with references to recently defined capital city of Balasatin and then kingdom of Unkipatina through Toronto University expedition. Following a half century break, the region was retargeted for extensive research on the direction of Astahan Yenay. When the second round of archaeological surveys were concentrated on understanding the shifting settlement patterns in relation to the turmoil political history of the Near East and Anatolia via interconnected research strategies targeting the environmental and the anthropogenic factors over changing landscape, landscape and shifting settled human activity. Tony Wilkinson's inspiring geoarchaeological research program resulted with the understanding of the gradual expansion of the Amuk Lake from Calcolithic to Iron Age, providing the first data set to define the relationship between changing landscape and responses given by the inhabitants of Amuk Valley through under diverse political and cultural entities. The results brought up the potential of geoarchaeological research in an alluvial floodplain and took the landscape approach further beyond rather than being as treated as a passive background. Then of course, it became a primary interest for teams of Telechana and Teltainat. The efforts and motivations of both teams relied on the fact that settlement shift occurs between these two tiles corresponding to time periods between 4.2K and 3.2K BP climatic events thus making it necessary to cross-correlate alluvial sedimentation with archaeological sequences. While the earliest textual evidence comes from Telechan's Middle Bronze Age levels, providing the name of the city as Alala, the earliest textual references targeting the region is coming from Telmardik Ebla Palace G archives with the mention of the city of Alalahu, suggesting that perhaps by then the name was geophysically your reference to Tel Tainat, where the third millennium BC sequence was encountered. A second cycle of shift is observed at the end of late Bronze Age and Iron Age occupation continued at Tel Tainat, but Iron Age remains were also encountered at Tel Achana, especially around the temple area. The current state of the archeological data has been framed by Yenar under the larger concept of a mega city, expanding into two tiles where its different sectors were settled in different times, being dependent on the shifting riverbeds of Orontes River. An extensive boring operation conducted by Tainat team has revealed the lower city of Tainat, showing that the site was not limited to the town itself, but expanded in multiple directions. Boring and off-site surveys carried around Telachana revealed that the site was likely surrounded by the Orontes River in the Middle and Late Bronze Ages. All these projects were successful at implementing boring strategies to define the shifting relationship between Taltainat and Telechana, as well as their heavily dependent relation to Orontes River through time. But due to the limited, limited amount of archeological data targeting the transition from Early Bronze Age to Middle Bronze Age, the social dynamics behind physical shifts yet remained a research question to be focused. At Tel Tainat, the ongoing efforts resulted with the exposure of a burnt building complex in field one, creating an anchorage with Ebla post palace G sequence, in particular with the arcade palace that defines the EB4B, the late Amuk J sequence. This exposure is extremely important for establishing late early Bronze Age chronology as well as patterns of collapse in the Amuk Valley, but limited in size is also unfortunately disconnected in its nature due to the absence of Middle Bronze Age levels above. The understanding of this specific temporal moment through Telechana's first settlement period is perhaps a more complicated task since terminal early Bronze Age and early Middle Bronze levels are under water table and we cannot go any further down in our deep soundings located in the courtyards of level four and level seven palaces, according to our risk assessments, and now they are unfortunately backfilled. Earlier time periods await data from our Eastern Slope and temple sounding excavations. Nevertheless, the archeology span from the Amuk Valley and neighboring regions 
show signs of reurbanization in the beginnings of Middle Bronze Age as a supra-regional phenomenon extending along the borders of Orontes, Euphrates, and Tigris river systems and Halis Basin, Middle Bronze Age is marked by monumental scale construction programs reflecting the complexity issue in the use of space and symbolic representation of the prestige and power of autonomous cities and kingdoms. This was best observed at Alala through 1930s excavations, yielding a continuous Middle Bronze Age occupation with a peak reached at level seven, reflected itself in the formation of spaces of administration, power, and prestige. In 1956, Sidney Smith stated that Alala has provided the unique opportunity to visualize historical events in stratigraphically defined archeological context. This correct observation unfortunately failed in practice due to these over ambitious historical attributions, overstepping or sometimes eliminating the physical reality of the archeological data. Alala, the capital city of the later late Bronze Age kingdom of Mukish was never a primary leader in the time of great powers, but it was subservient to kingdom of Yamhat based at Aleppo in the Middle Bronze Age. Four kings can be counted according to level seven text, while at Yamhat seven kings were in rule. This historical reconstruction roughly covers the 18th and 17th centuries BC. The Middle Bronze Age levels at Talishana have under investigation in the last years with squares located in strategic points in the royal precinct, cross-cutting Guli's excavation area, as well as in the northern slope of the Tal and southwestern elevation elevated portion of the site. New excavations have already confirmed and expanded our understanding of the pre-level seven Middle Bronze Age sequence, where partial exposures of earlier palace and temple complexes are providing a glimpse of what the site looks like throughout the 19th and 18th centuries BC. These ex exposures, although absent from archival sources, clearly dictate the administrative capacity of the city. A severely burned kitchen context of an earlier palace with its substantial mud brick walls and a complete in city assemblage was exposed in our sounding operation conducted in the main courtyard of the level seven palace. Following the same structural organization with the level seven, this earlier complex was in high probability located along the line of the fortification system, where a series of rooms with serving and storage functions were utilized for food related activities. In order to better visualize the relationship between the still standing level seven palace walls and the earlier palatial structure, the slide on the screen shows the archeological deposition between these two building phases. In relation to this deposition, the radiocarbon dates acquired from the short-lived samples provided provisionally rather earlier dates. So the dating of this context is still provisional and still needs further comparative data. The continuation of the very same building has now been explored in the southern wing of the level seven palace, where the results testify our interpretation that the structure defines an earlier palace in fact, much more substantial than the level seven palace itself. The same burning event is also traced in this building, but the floor levels between these two excavation units is almost two meters. This is not surprising since the level seven palace hold the same terrace construction principles where the floor between Southern and Northern wings varies up to two meters, thus providing that much of the middle bronze age topography of the site was formed prior to level seven. According to Muge Bulu, the assistant director of ceramic studies, pre-level seven ceramic data acquired from Bully's palace and temple soundings and from our excavations imply a strong continuity in the choices of shapes and minimal foreign impact in the development of artistic choices in pottery production. But appearance of serious solution wear in central Anatolian context at Kültepe and Ajenemeyük signify the extent of these early connections. This is further confirmed by the presence of hundreds of ivory inlays or elephant tusks pointing to the ivory production 
and close connection to central Anatolian sites like Ajemeric. The recently discovered fragment of a middle minoan to Kamerespe fragment below the sealed cement floors of level seven, on the other hand, proves with no doubt that the connections with the Aegean world were already established prior to level seven and complicates further the understanding of the chronology and synchronization methods. In addition to Bully's findings, the recently discovered fresco fragments in the construction field of the level seven palace in the southern wing has now direct our attention to understand the origins of wall painting practices in Near East and Anatolia. The appearance of wall paintings at Alalah, Katna, Mari, Tel Kabri, Tel Saka, Tel Burak, and Tel El Daba are generally accepted as a product of Mediterranean Koine and look through a very fixed egocentric perspective. This certainly owes its reason at Alalah to Nimer's and Nimer's reconstruction of the Alalah frescoes found by Vuli and now in display in Ashmoli Museum. The reconstructions are purely inspired from Aegean examples specifically from the seated griffin of Knossos and the bull with double head axis. A new reconstruction based on all woolly excavation photographs showing the fragments in situ are suggesting a different view. This is not going to be detailed here in this talk, but I encourage the audience to go through this fascinating article recently published by Aslahan Yener. I call this example a paradigm shift in reading archeological evidence she found in Anatolia and now brought forward the question on the origins of wall painting practices in the Eastern Mediterranean world. The Middle Bronze Age operations also revealed evidences on the use of space in terms of cult and ritual. Our ambitious sounding operation located in the courtyard of the Late Bronze Age Palace had revealed five distinct architectural phases. The earliest local phase five building with multiple floor levels reaching six meters below the ground level of the courtyard of level four palace shows unusual architectural practices attested in the royal precinct during the Middle Bronze Age. The building had a curvilinear extension in the southern wing. And this tradition in a building of monumental size ascribes a special feature. Such buildings are not encountered during the Middle Bronze Age in the Near East or Anatolia. We suggested that this building might have served as a sanctuary or a sacred space, especially with its close proximity to temple area formerly excavated by Wuli. A similar structure excavated at Talbia Tutu in Northeastern Syria was defined as the Temple of Tagan. Unfortunately, since our building is absent from institute finds, it's hard to tell its intended origin. But since there were several deities worshipped at Alala, it is not surprising to find several temples dedicated to various deities. In regards to this architectural practice, the remarkable monumental underground stone structure exposed in close proximity to the palace of Tukkis in the city of Tel Mozan Urkesh is another unique example that may perhaps signal hurrying construction practices in cult and ritual buildings in the late early Bronze Age. According to its excavators, the stone covered underground structure, Habi, served as a sacred space for the spirits of the netherworld in accordance with the hurrying rituals known from later Hittite sources. Thus, speculatively, the presence of an epsidal building in the late Middle Bronze Age at Alala may represent temple building practices with Northern Mesopotamian origins. This is in accordance with the presence of Hurrian names at Alala level seven archives. The presence of a curvilinear structure from the succeeding Mitannian levels at the site reinforces this argument. Going to the northwest slope of the town, Alala Cemetery discovered on the outer side of the fortification wall has generated over 300 inhumation burials from Middle Bronze to Late Bronze One context, creating a perfect data set for understanding population dynamics through material culture and also geno uh, genomic and isotopic research. 
The outstanding results of the genomic research revealed evidence regarding genetic shifts observed throughout the early Bronze Age, Middle Bronze Age transition in the region, and the isotopic research suggested less human mobility during the Middle and Late Bronze Ages, which I will discuss more in the coming slides. In terms of city planning, the late Middle Bronze II fortification wall with an external buttress was exposed, and we observed that craft quarters were located along the line of the fortification system, whereas the exterior slope of the town was used as the cemetery of the settlement. In a small space of 10 by 5 and in one and a half meters of accumulation on the slope, this burial density creates a challenging puzzle since often one burial cuts another. Secondary burial practices were also seen to be attested either intentionally or accidentally due to the high number of burials disturbing each other. It is particularly interesting to see that Middle Bronze Age pottery types were used as burial gifts also during the late Bronze One, signifying the conservative aspects in burial practices with their usage over a long period of time. Adding to this population density, the Middle Bronze Age at Alala witnessed technological advancements and highly skilled craft production under palace control as discussed in ivory production or stone craftsmanship revealing itself in the variety of locally produced foreign influence vessels. And of course, sculptures all pointing to the considerable extent of the production capacity reach at the site. The Alala assemblages in general thus dictates already well-established contacts with Eastern Mediterranean, Near Eastern and Anatolian partners. But what made Alala rich and prosperous apart from agriculture? According to Level 7 archives, with its organization of witty and viniculture hinterlands, olive oil and wine were imported commodities that Alala maintained and benefited from. And here I find the opportunity to recommend this excellent book by my colleague Jacob Langer, which outlines the management of hinterland when the site was under the rule of Yarim Nim's dynasty. And with respect to textual records, I would like to take the opportunity and take you to the high hinterland of Alala, the modern Altanus region, where under the direction of Patay Archaeological Museum, we have been conducting rescue excavations at the periphery site of Toprakisar Hög. Altanuzu is a relatively unknown region for the earlier history, since until lately, much of the archaeological research was concentrated on the floodplain, excluding the highland periphery dynamics. To conduct research excavations at the periphery site created the exclusive possibility to explore the often theoretically emphasized center and periphery dynamics within its, within its regional setting, as well as the role that the peripheries played in the larger understanding of the regional and interregional exchange systems. Along with the classical period farmsteads, the number of mound type set sites with prehistoric occupations showed that Toprakisar was along the route that connected the Amuk to Highland Valley sites in the Southwest and to the Lower Orontes region in Syria, likely through multiple hilltop passages. This must be one of the regions that, according to his records, Zimrilim of Mari sent ambassadors for purchasing vineyards within the territory of Alahtum, Alala. The institutional organization of the production and then distribution of olive oil and wine has been regarded as major sources of income for the palatial systems in the Eastern Mediterranean Bronze Age. According to available textual references, it was highly prized outside of its limited production zones, and major sites like Mari and Amar in the Euphrates had to acquire their wine from Aleppo and its vicinity. Olive oil and wine was extensively referenced at Palace G, Ebla text, and Alalah Middle and Late Bronze Age textual sources dealing with land tenure and the exchange and purchasing of towns. The textual evidence implies that certain administrative privileges were granted to settlements specialized in olive oil production. Also, according to Steve Batchuk's excellent research, wine as an important commodity 
was highly requested by the rising elites of the late early Bronze Age, an economic niche suggested to be filled by the early Transcaucasian groups settled in the highland periphery of the Amur Valley. I strongly agree, but would also like to add olive oil to this interpretation. Today, the hills around Toprakisar are covered with naturally ground and cultivated olive trees, and the business of olive oil constitute the main source of income. Not surprisingly, archaeobotanical research at Toprakisar has been revealing evidence for significant amount of olive and grape consumption. In this setting, located 140 meters above sea level, Toprakisar gently connects with the Piedmont of the hills and can be defined as a hillside mound settlement. The undisturbed section of the site extends roughly across an area of one to two hectares, but the exact expansion of the site is unclear due to the significant human impact in the region. Heavily damaged by Toprakisar village located on top, it is also under the threat from the Yarseli Dam that was constructed in 1980s, which became the primary motivator for the initiation of rescue excavations. The dam reservoir supplies the yearly water demand for extensive agricultural activities and it surrounds the site from south to northeast. The preliminary extensive surveys conducted on the eastern lower slope of the site revealed material evidence that the site was continu continuously occupied from at least 6 millennium BC to the first half of the first millennium BC with a break during the late Middle Bronze Age, which lasted throughout the late Bronze Age. This is in contrast to Amuk Valley settlements is a key feature since much of the recent archeological research conducted in the Amuk at the sites of Tal Kurdu, Tel Achana, and Tel Tainat have revealed archeological data from narrowly defined chronological time periods. This problem created major gaps significantly in the prehistoric sequence and in the understanding of local responses given to larger phenomena, such as the Ubaid Yuruk affinities, the early Transcaucasian influence, and the lesser known early Middle Bronze Age transition in the Amuk Valley. This current state ironically allowed us to expose immediately below the topsoil the highly preserved remains of a Middle Bronze I administrative building complex. The following five years of fieldwork succeeded with the exposure of three distinct building phases from EB4B to Middle Bronze I, what exactly we are missing from Teltaina, Telechana, megacity combination. While we have so far published the Middle Bronze Age extensively, the early Bronze 4B building complex, which we excavated over the last two, three years, comprehend the nature of the transition from a single site in the Ambo with enough contextual coverage. Unfortunately, C14 dates from EB4B contexts are not analyzed yet due delays created by the side effects of the pandemic. Nevertheless, cross-correlation of the material culture with recently published Teltainat EB4B C14 sequence and the Middle Bronze 1 Toprakisar C14 dates, as well as through architectural changes observed from Early Bronze Age to Middle Bronze 1, all together may help us to correlate the Amuk site with the hinterland for understanding the center periphery dynamics in a period of transformations. The EB4 building at Toprakisar exposed in 125 square meter area is completely destroyed by fire. Revealing a rich material culture, it allows us to comprehend the function of spaces and to get a glimpse of the stress, stress patterns that seem to be observed at the end of early Bronze Age. The ceramic assemblage from local phase five building falls into Northwest Syrian pottery tradition defined through Ebla and Tainat sequence. Cooking related assemblages consist of cooking pots and with and without handles as well as handled bowls. In terms of decorated ceramics, this building yielded several smeared washware jugs, jars and bowls, some with putter marks, as well as examples of pattern comb The painted pottery reflects the painted simple wear characterized by typical geometric designs. Following the destruction of local phase five building, a shallow phase revealing a completely utilitarian function 
including open-air pyrotechnic installations and small-scale units likely related to small-scale production was excavated. This ephemeral phase defines the transition. The striking changes in the architecture occurred in the succeeding phase when a monumental scale building was erected, but this time in a complete different orientation, suggesting a significant change in the use of space. This change should be settlement-wise, as changing of an orientation of a large building requires several modifications. Such changes in the architecture may be linked to cultural and administrative changes. The Middle Bronze One building was also burned. Identical assemblages, including storage jars, cooking pots, and grinding stones were found nearby horseshoe-shaped parts, indicating that both courtyards were organized according to stages of food production. The dendrochronological research conducted by Sharon Pearson provides consistent C14 readings. The sample presented here in screen was selected from a short-lived round wood, non-structural timber to avoid any old wood issues pointing to the end of 21st century BC and to the beginnings of 20th century BC. Ceramics retrieved from building two share the same characteristics with Middle Bronze Age assemblages from Telachan. Although low in numbers and fragmentary in condition, cereal silicium ware bowl jars and other closed shaped vessels, as well as low, quant low quality copies of gray burnished ware bowls, which are generally associated with elite usage at Alala, are present at Toprakisar. Of the six horseshoe-shaped parts, four were found as pairs of large and small in the courtyards. The most distinctive aspect of Toprakisar horseshoe-shaped parts is the application of decoration to their frontal faces. Decorated horseshoe-shaped parts are not known from any Middle or Late Bronze Age context at Telechana. This decorated tradition, on the contrary, seemed to be well appreciated at Middle Bronze Age Toprakisar. The decoration applied on the horseshoe-shaped parts unequivocally defines the extent of the interaction between the artifact and its user. In this respect, individuals involved in the act of making hearts or cooking at a peripheral site seem to have developed strong bonds with the living space and the utilitarian objects that they produced. Rur rural ritual activity with regards to the construction of this building was also noted through foundation ritual pits prior to the construction of building two. The objects used in this ritual context are of a peculiar character, further contributing to the understanding of their temporal and spatial distribution in Near Eastern context. Generally defined as stone spirits, the crudeness of the style attested in this statue is identical to the stylized male and female stone reliefs found in late Bronze One context at Telachana. These were also carved in worshiping posture and were associated with Uromitanian levels at the site. The Toprakisarvik examples from early Middle Bronze Age context may indicate that the practice of placing crudely carved figurines as voting offerings or as protective spiritual guardians evolved long before the Mitannian era in the region. In accordance with the distribution patterns of the available data sets, this may perhaps signal a nomadic pastoralist identity in its origin that is not local to the Amuk Valley prior to the beginnings of Middle Bronze Age. Several more of these crude figurines were found under the walls, again, pointing to some sort of a foundation ritual. Thus, we suggested that rituals performed for an administrative building dictate its importance from a rural perspective. Political messaging through a ritual was needed to create a bond between the community and the administration for the efficient use of corvée labor in tasks like olive and grave picking or in construction of public spaces. This ritual mode of production exclusively defines the way communal ritual practices were used by authorities as a way of establishing and emphasizing political power. These objects were not intended to be viewed by an audience, yet their moment of placement 
was used to engrave a moment in the constructed collective political and cultural memory of its residents. The ground plan of building two excavated at Toprakisar also strikingly shares the same construction principles with the structures like Western Palace of Ebla, Level 7 Palace of Alala, or Kinetic Building on the other side of the Mamanos Mountains, particularly with their sections dedicated to storage and large-scale cooking. The current evidence acquired from the site, on the contrary, showed that although smaller in size, the site was granted certain privileges by perhaps being involved in the business of olive oil and wine, which provided a unique character. So what all these admixtures in the architecture and material culture observed in the beginnings of the Middle Bronze Age at an hinterland site may suggest. Harvey Weiss has discussed the relationship between 4.2 kbp climatic event and the archeologically not well-traced population movements that likely occurred at the end of third millennium BC. The 4.2K event created arid environmental conditions and it's suggested as a catalyst behind the nomadization of diverse groups, such as Amorites and Hurrians, and their movement to more favorable and climatically less stressed regions. The Orontes River and its catchment area is defined as one of the habitat tracking zone. This environmental issue in prom prompting long distance cultural interactions may reasonably be seen as one of the triggers behind the appearance of the stone spirits at Toprakisar in the early Middle Bronze Age or in decorated horseshoe shaped parts identical to Tigris sites, since ritual paraphernalia or ways of cooking are regarded as distinct markers for defining culturally and traditionally distinct groups. It is important to note that no such type of arts or ritual, para or ritual paraphernalia were encountered, particularly from the EB4B building. The relationship between climate change and human mobility has also now become one of the major research questions of ancient DNA studies. The gene flow defined in the transition from the early Bronze Age to Middle Bronze Age that is evident in human remains from Talmardic Ebla, Tedachana Alala, may signal a Northern Mesopotamian genetic contribution, a suggestion still to be conferred through analysis of samples from this area. And perhaps Mehmet Somaz and Yilmaz Erdal's work on human remains from Euphrates and Tigris sites may further testify this hypothesis. With much regards to mobility patterns, I would like to present you one final object from Toprakisar coming from another excavation area that was opened on the northern slope where a terrace had already been cut by locals to create space for agricultural activity. A mold made lead figurine was found in the disturbed surface mixed by plowing about the middle bronze one grain storage facilities. While the mold has not been recovered, the figurine is assumed to have been produced in a two-part mechanism, judging by various examples, particularly from Kültepe. Although found in a disturbed context, in line with the archeological evidence pointing to the presence of foundation and termination rituals at the site, the apotropaic function of Toprakisar lead figurine is proposed to be related to the protection of the agricultural supply if it is to be regarded as part of a bottle deposit. The presence of a large number of well-built deep silos in a limited excavation area may perhaps confirm that serious precautions were taken to preserve the yearly grain stock aided by rituals targeting collective community experiences. In the context of dry farming geographies of Northern Mesopotamia and Anatolia, where agricultural activity is dependent on rainfall, the object is suggested to be dedicated to a storm god in the foundation, in the form of a foundation peg. The form of the foundation peg may therefore be a representation of a bull standing perhaps over mountains or his temple, another common storm god motif. The functional designation as a foundation peg or a votive disposal object is in accordance with the building rituals of Northern Mesopotamia. The iconography, on the other hand, 
is stylistically similar to Syria Anatolian mold made lead figurines and copper alloy foundation packs that were produced by communities involved in the business of trade. These iconographic and functional attributes were then perhaps forged into the cult of storm god at a hinterland site, which we propose to have attracted habitat tracking populations during the environmentally stressed late early Bronze Age, early Middle Bronze Age periods, which were also characterized by intense cultural encounters. But much of our understanding of ritual practices in the Near East is coming from tell sites. Yet the relationship between human and their surrounding landscape extend beyond the perimeters of living spaces. Thus being said, I would like to take you to the other end of the Amuk Valley, the unexplored hilly landscape of Krikan, particularly Kızılkaya. Kızılkaya limestone massif is located along the narrow passageway that connects the Amuk to Islaya plain on the north and to Afrin Valley on the east. And it's one of the rocky limestone hilltops located in the region. Over hundreds of dolmens were found extending over this five kilometer rock outcrop. Whether used as cenotaphs, gateways to celestial world or actual burial grounds, the remnants of cultic activity defines its symbolic value, at least from late Chalcolithic onwards. A megalithic structure, a building of rectangular shape stood on the southern summit of Kızılkaya, visible from a long range in a day with less humidity. A high resolution drone mapping revealed how the structure was incorporated into terrain resembling the high top quarters at Büyükkale in Hattusha, but at a reduced scale. The presence of early second millennium BC pottery in the Luther's pit and around dictate that perhaps we are looking at one of the hilltop storm god temple parallels we know from much later Hittite centers. Here the wind blows strong, the sun sets in a theatrical fashion and the Kızılkaya massive dominate the landscape creating an ideal location for creating bonds with the celestial world. The dating of this structure to early second millennium BC may perhaps signal how the cult of storm god was evolved in climatically stressed time periods, further emphasizing the bounded relationship between climate and social behaviors. Moving forward from Middle Bronze Age periphery, open air sanctuaries, cult and ritual, and back to the capital city of Alala, the late Bronze Age in the Amuk witnessed to the ambitious empire building efforts of Mitannians and Hittites. This is best observed at Alala in the sequence following the destruction of level seven palace, which is historically associated with Atushili the first. This certainly had a dramatic impact in the royal precinct, best observed in square 3257, where above the ruins of epsidal building, the subsequent faces reveal no administrative or cultic structures, but small scale production related buildings in a large street context. The chaotic environment is reflected with a number of what we can call crime scenes. An adult facing down was found in the corner of a building while a woman of 40, 45 uh, age was found dumped into the bottom of a well. Surprisingly, the well lady has a genetic ancestry to Central Asia, expanding our understanding of the Bronze Age mobility patterns. Can she be a slave? Can her presence be related with the metal trade networks extending to Afghanistan? That for now remains unsolved. The regeneration and the establishment of central authority is evident in the succeeding phase where administrative and large scale structures reappear. Phase two contains cylinder seals and sealing practices that define the early Mitannian influence in the region. Level four as an important turning point defines a new era in Alala's occupational history. The construction of the palace with its colonnaded and stepped entrance is defined as one of the earliest examples of Bitilani type architecture, which become the characteristics of Iron Age temples and palaces in the Near East. In accordance with Eva Van Dasso's work, the construction of level four palace 
is now attributed to King of Idrimi, who says in his autobiographic inscription that he became subservient to King Mitanni and King Paratana and built a new palace at Alala. This is the same time period for the introduction of a Mitannian allied pottery practice defined as Nuziveir to its first discovery at Nuzi Yorgantepe, which was adopted and transformed into a locally produced Achana ver towards the end of 14th century BC with motifs including flower or rosette designs. For more than a century, the site enjoyed the prosperity and prestige developed under Mitannian suzerainty best reflected in the high quality production of faience, frites, glass objects, as well as in sculpture and through archival sources. But the archeological level following the destruction of level four palace, possibly by Hittites under Tutalia II question mark, and its implications in the wider socio-political landscape were presented erroneously in Woolley's final publication. It is expressed that a massive Hittite fortress made of mud bricks was located above the ruins of level four palace following its destruction. However, our excavations show that following the destruction of the palace and the adjacent castle complex, at least the castle was successively rebuilt three times inferior to the erection of the so-called the Great Hittite Fortress. All published in detail in the, this is all published detail in the recent monograph. This deposition allows us to create archeological space in the timeline for names such as Adat Nirari, who was only mentioned at the Idrimi statue as his son, and Ituradu, who was only referenced as the king of Mukish, who fought against Shukulima as part of the Syrian coalition. The 2003 10 excavations revealing the Western extension of the Great Hittite Fortress does indeed confirm its attribution to King Shukulima I, but redefined it as a single phase mud brick platform that was constructed for a larger superstructure over the ruins of the level four castle, a fortress which has also now been confirmed to be left unfinished in antiquity as there are no floor levels associated with this structure. The contemporary area for exposures in the southwestern elevated section of the town in six trenches revealed another fortress type structure sharing the same construction principles as the Northern fortress with the use of case-made mud brick foundations. The Northern and Southern fortress defined the abrupt changes observed in the city with the application of new Hittite defense strategies. The close relationship between the Hittite landscape and its symbolic and functional perception formed the cultural landscape of Anatolia in the Middle and Late Bronze Ages. Mukish in the 14th century BC was a hostile territory and the Hittite management must have required a process of adaptation, which in the case of Allah was achieved by political and military suppression as also evident by textual references. Symbolism encoded in the use of space at Alala in the form of fortresses as the three dimensional embodiment of a new ruling authority not only expressed the Hittite socio-economic and military policies toward North Syria, but brought forward the question of how to define and analyze the complex patterns of interactions and local responses that led to the formation of adaptation and hybridization in the material culture, such as here on the screen, the Hittite pointed jacket, which transformed into a new style at Allah. The distinct Hittite markers, such as tablets yielding names of Hittite officials, governor, Tutalia relief, seal impressions with Anatolian hieroglyphic inscriptions, and lapis lazuli Hittite question, again in question mark, and the three spiked ceremonial shaft acts are examples to define the Hittite presence and the reflection of the capital's administrative control over the region. But there is still a lot to explain, and perhaps our temple sounding may indeed provide further clues on imperial policies. The recently discovered cuneiform tablets in different layers of a street deposit 
marks an important era of transitions. While the fragment uh, on the left is a witness list providing connections to level four archives with known Hurian names, a presence of a certain king unnamed on a record of disimbursements may clue on the days of administrative shift from Mitannian to Hittite overlords, as the tablet reveals traces of both Mitannian and Hittite epigraphic practices. But this I leave to Jacob Langer, as he today just started working on these two tablets at Hatay Archaeological Museum. The exciting discovery of a bulla with hieroglyphic inscriptions from last year's new excavation area further add to our understanding of the end of late Bronze Age as the hieroglyphic inscription revealed the name of a new Hittite prince that we had previously no record of at Alala. I will keep the bulla discreet as Hassan Peker, who is also in the audience, is currently working on the piece. However, I'm happy to announce that the inscription revealed the name of Prince Halpaziti. Halpaziti is not mentioned in many Hittite records, and this person is likely to become the king of Aleppo, the last Hittite king assigned, the last Hittite king assigned to Aleppo. I guess Hassan Peker uh, will be happy to give further information in the discussion session. Our current understanding about Alalah dictates that the site lost its power at the beginning of 13th century BC, although the temples continued to exist. Perhaps the administrative management was again shifted to Tel Tainat in that time. The settlement shifts and a certain level of collapse defined the end of late Bronze Age or the beginnings of the so-called Dark Age. Through our Turkish National Science Foundation project, we have been tackling these social dynamics from the perspective of geoarchaeology through our new sedimentary coring program, including data collection strategies from all of the sites discussed in this talk. This all started at Toprakisar in 2017, where we implemented a marine coring method in a terrestrial deposit with the aid of the dam itself. We effectively acquired an undisturbed sequence with various different types of deposits, providing that the system is fully operational. The modified system was then installed to a motorized truck where we successfully acquired four cores between Tel Achana and Tel Tainat. One of the Achana core, according to C14, C14 dating, revealed a sedimentation sequence from Pleistocene to present day and was subject to Etrax core scan. The preliminary analysis revealed that the Pleistocene Holocene transition marked with a calcium titanium anomaly indicating warmer and wetter climbing climatic conditions. A reverse pattern is observed for 3.2 kbp event, indicating a period of drought and aridity. This is exactly the time period when we observed a shift from Telachana to Tel Tainat. 4.2 kbp is also likely traced in this core. However, since the Orontes River passed three times through this location and create a gap, we decided to increase the number of cores so that a high resolution sequence can be constructed. To fill in the gaps in the cores, as well as to establish a climate record through the Amuk Lake, the project expanded with, with the acquisition of further cores between Tainat and Achana, Tel Kurdu, and the now drained Amuk Lake. The field work is finished and we are expecting to be done with the full spectrum of analysis this summer, and we will be able to provide a non-biased data set acquired through an extremely high resolution sampling strategy for the Eastern Mediterranean world. This project included the extremely difficult task of acquiring undisturbed cores. The heavy field work continued for more than a month where we successfully extracted cores varied from 10 to 21 meters in 24 different locations. The extracted cores were cut, documented, packed, and now are at a Middle East Technical University for geochemical and pollen analysis. Most of the analysis are now complete and we hopefully will present the results at Arvales Levant in December with entitled Climate Change and Societal Transformations in the Amok Valley of Hatay from the Late Neolithic to Iron Age. 
the preliminary results of the regional sediment coring project. So this presentation was a result of many, many years of field work and owes much respect to all of the team members of the excavations, survey, and geoarchaeological field work. I hope you enjoyed the tour in the Amuk and thank you for your participation. Thank you so much for this wonderful presentation that um, gave a wonderful, perfect overview of um, all your research and also uh, polished our uh, understanding of uh, the Bronze Age and Iron Ages in the region. So uh, I suppose, I mean, in this series, we have been 